So my name is Michael Edwards. Uh, I have my PhD in genetics. I got that from the University of Wisconsin. Um, for the past 10 years, I worked at the University of Colorado in the pulmonary department. Uh, most of what I do is look at biological data. So the, the easiest answer for what I do is I'm a data scientist. So if you have data, if you have numbers, I'm going to look at it. The thing is, is if you have biological data, they call me a bioinformatician. Does anybody know what a bioinformatician is? That's not in the front row. <laughs> anybody? It's okay, I get that look a lot. <laughs> so I even made a video on my channel to kind of show you what that's about. So let me see if I can uh, play this on this thing. So let's kind of break down bioinformatics. If, we, if you look at the word bio, what do you think that stands for? Yeah. Uh, biological. Biological, yes. Biology, pretty much. The study of living things. What about info? What do you think that's all about? Yes. Information. Yes, information. What do you think we use? So biology has a lot of information. I'm going to talk to you about that. What do you think we use to gather all that information? What's this? Yes, computers. Yes, so biology, computers, and then mat that last part, Maddox. What do you think that, what does that sound like, Maddox? Yes? Sounds kind of like mathematics. Correct. Boy, you're almost like a plant. Yes, that is correct. So what I do is I use computers and I use math to determine, to figure out biology. And I do this in a lot of different subjects. So I don't know if some of you remember me. I came, I think it was career day. What was that, sixth grade? Was that sixth grade, something like that? Yeah. So I came and I actually gave you, to kind of demonstrate what I do, I gave you a problem to demonstrate, you know, some of the problems that I investigated. So given here are a bunch of letters. What do you think that corresponds to? And I know you guys have been studying this, so. Yeah. Different genes, but what do you think the letters are? Yes. Yes, perfect. So what this stands for, what this is showing is six individuals in the black letters that have, don't have a disease, and these six individuals in the red have a, a particular disease, okay? What I do is, what I try to do is I look at all this data and I figure out what do these people with this disease have that these people don't. So if you look here, can you tell what does everybody in the red have that everybody in the black doesn't? Yeah. CAT. CAT. Actually, the A, right? So everybody here, if you look at these nucleotides, everybody that's normal has a T at this position, and everybody has an A. What does A normally bind to? What does A always partner to? Yes. T. Thymine, yes. If you even know the uh, amino, the uh, nucleotide. What does C always bind to? G, right. So that's why we can only, all we have to do is put actually one, one uh, half of that DNA on and we know the other half. So what does this mean? So in this particular instance, what I showed you, this is a disease called sickle cell anemia. Has anybody heard of that before? Yeah, a little bit. You guys talked about it in uh, science. All right, great. So in a normal individual, in the black individuals, at this position, when they have a T, they make this glutamine. This is amino acid. So everything gets re read off your DNA. Here, in sickle cell anemia, this, this mistake, when you replace this T with an A, you make this va valine in the transcribed amino acid. And what does that mean? That when these normal people with a normal DNA sequence, they produce this normal hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is this molecule in all your blood cells that carries oxygen throughout your body. If you don't have hemoglobin, you will die. <laughs> you will not get enough oxygen. These individuals with sickle cell anemia, they have a valine and it kinks the structure. You can see this nice kind of puffy hemoglobin here. Now it's kind of kinked. And what does that mean? So that in the blood cell, this kinking, what, is it, what it does is in a normal person, these blood cells are nice and puffy, but over here you can see these blood cells are sickled. Almost looks like a half moon or a, a sickle moon. 
these individuals, although they can't carry oxygen as well as a normal person, they still live, right? Does anybody know why people have, why, why we've, we've uh, carried on the hemoglobin? Does anyone, so if you have sickle cell anemia, you're not going to live as long, but it protects you from something else. Does anybody know what that might be? This is extra way bonus points. No. <laughs> but good glad, guess. Uh, disease caused malaria. So in these, for these individuals, even though they don't live as long and they can't carry oxygen as well, they survive this nasty parasite called uh, malaria. So in a way, some of these mutations or these sequence changes can be passed on because they, even though it might be harms uh, uh, a person, it also might provide a benefit as well. But what else can our DNA tell us, right? It's very easy to, to find a particular disease caused by one little change, but what else, what else can, we, can our DNA tell us about us? It can tell us where we came from. Has anybody heard of the company 23andMe? Any of your parents use that? No? So it's a company, what you can do is you can basically take a little cheek swab, you put it in a little tube, you send it to them, and they will read your DNA. From that, they will tell you where all your ancestors probably came from. And you will be surprised <laughs> where your ancestors came from. That even though we all look different, we're a big mess of a lot of different cultures. Who we are now, that if I commit a crime, say I killed somebody here and I went like this and then I left and I went, you know, I wasn't there at the scene of the crime, the cops showed up. If they take a swab, they will know that I was there at the scene of the crime because they can test my DNA, right? We can do this and we can do this for all kinds of different stuff so that Wherever you go, you leave little bits of your DNA around that people can basically collect and then sequence. But I think the most intriguing question that I find is what will we become, right? And that's the big question. Because your DNA will tell you where you came from, right? It'll tell you who you kind of are now. It'll tell your eye color, all that stuff. But it can also tell you whether you might potentially get a disease later on in life, something that might be fatal something you might be able to do something about now, right? And that's why everybody's very interested and that's why my job is in high demand because everybody wants to know, be able to read somebody's DNA and be, be able to predict the future. You also want to do this with kids too. <laughs> Can you imagine having a four-year-old and knowing exactly what he's going to look like while he's four years old when he's like 30? That'd be cool. All right. So what does this have to do with me? And I'm going to show you this picture, and this kind of demonstrates why I think this is very important. This right here is the panel of access to my genome. So I've had my DNA sequenced. And based on that, this company will tell me out of 1,230 medical conditions that I might potentially get. Not only that, it will tell me my response to 16 prescribed medications. That some medications that people take will save their lives. But if another person takes that same medication, it'll kill them because their DNA is different. We can use this information, DNA, to figure out who can we give this medicine to and who could we not. And every time I log in, and I can log into my genome anywhere on this planet. And if you look down here, every time I log in, it gives me this little uh, kind of a, a thing about my genome says, based on your DNA, we see you are less likely to have a flush reaction if you drink alcohol. Basically, that's saying I'm not allergic to alcohol, and I knew that. <laughs> Trust me, I knew that. That my ancestors came from Germany and Italy uh, where, where alcohol was kind of part of the culture, and so people developed enzymes to break it down as better. If you go to places like Asia where alcohol wasn't, uh, as big a, a part of the culture, you see a lot of people that are allergic to, to alcohol. And again, we can determine all this through the DNA. And again, I talked about 23andMe, and then there's another company called Ancestry DNA, which, which specializes in, in particular uh, races and, and genealogies. But what's really happening, and what's really exciting is not only are they going to tell you where you came from, but they're going to tell you how to live better based on what your DNA sequence is. 
look at this. I found this website while I was kind of messing around. It's a DNA called, or a, a website called Helix. And it says, are you still struggling to lose weight? The secrets in your DNA. Basically, what they're telling you is that, hey, if you're having a hard time losing weight, maybe we can take your DNA sequence. There's, maybe you have a problem in your enzymes that we can basically identify with DNA sequence, and then we can actually give you a diet that will help you lose weight. And these companies are coming all over the place. But not only that, and this is the thing that I think is coming, is you can figure out what a person should eat, Maybe you could figure out who they should spend the rest of their life with, right? Match.com. Here I found this one, eHarmony. It says 29 dimensions of compatibility. Imagine 29 million dimensions of compatibility. Potentially we might be able to do this with our DNA. But it's not as easy as you might think. Obviously, you know, this all sounds really nice and, you know, like, oh, yeah, that's going to work. We have a problem, is that that one example that I gave you involved just one change in one letter, right? And that's just one base pair. But this change occurs in the hemoglobin gene, and that has 1,606 base pairs. So imagine finding that mistake in this. Now this gene is in our DNA. How many base pairs do you think our human DNA has? Anybody have an idea? Guess. Yeah. No. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Higher. Anybody else? Yeah. Three million. No. It is three billion base pairs. Right? Imagine finding that little mistake in three billion letters. And that's kind of what I do. And that's why I have to have computers and I have math to do this. Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, dang it. <laughs> Hold on. There it is. So it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack of needles, right? If I have 3 billion base pairs, that means I have 6, 000, 6 billion letters to go through. But the nice thing is most of your DNA is rubbish, <laughs> is garbage. You're like, no, it isn't. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I got this this uh, this pie chart off a of, – uh, article it said a brief history of rubbish and it's all about our history of our DNA that when you actually look at your DNA in each one of your cells only about 1% of it is actually the things that we call true genes things that make proteins so very very small percent so it's very easy for me or it's a lot easier for me to go through just that part than everything else but you have all kinds of other stuff so all the other stuff in between genes make up a big part of your DNA and we don't really know the function of a lot of this stuff, about 0.2% of it, you have active parasites in your DNA. You have little bits of DNA inside your DNA that jump around and kind of live by itself. Not only that, but those things die and leave its fossils in your DNA. So we can actually go, so about 11% of it are these fossils of these things jumping around in your DNA. Lots of repetitive DNA as well. And then we also have viruses that invade. And they leave DNA. When, they, when you get infected by a virus, it'll incorporate in your DNA. And then when it leaves, it leaves part of its stuff in your genome. That, does every, did anybody know that we have cat and dog and sheep and cow DNA in our, uh, in our human genome? Does anybody know that? We do. And it's from those viruses that once they jump into your cell and then they take off, they leave some of the DNA that they, that they collected from the last thing that it invaded. So we have cat DNA, and they always ask the question, I had some students ask me one time, they said, uh, so if we have cat DNA in our bodies, can it get activated and then we can get super sight? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's possible? No. no. <laughs> It'd be cool if it did. A lot of that stuff that all these organisms are leaving are, are, are basically kind of junk DNA. So, But if it did leave it something like that, yeah, potentially possible. Here's kind of what I see as my job, and this is kind of what I do, is I take all that information, right, that billions and billions of bits of information, it's kind of like pixels to me, that if you look at your flat screen TV, 
How many, you know, it's basically when you watch a movie, all you're watching are little boxes put together. How many little boxes do you think are in your average big screen TV? How many? <laughs> yeah. 16 billion. No. <laughs> Good guess anyway. About 2 million boxes. Do you see those boxes when you watch your, you know, like your sitcom or, you know, funny, you know, a music video? Do you see those? Right. But in general, you don't. Your mind puts those boxes together and it makes a picture. And that's exactly what I try to do with all this data. How can I take all this DNA, all this information, make a picture, and then give it to the doctor and say, hey, here's your disease. I think we should investigate this thing. I think this might cure the disease that you're looking at. It's kind of like finding patterns in data is what, you really, what it really turns out to be, is that you know, it's kind of like having, you know, say this is a normal person, this is somebody with a disease. Given that most things look alike, what are the few things that are different? And I could see, yeah, I know you guys are looking right now. <laughs> it's okay. Our minds have a, you know, we are naturally built to find patterns in different things. So I love talking to you guys, and I actually teach high school kids this kind of stuff because I think you guys are really good at it. Number one, you stand, understand you understand uh, computers, which is great, which is a lot better than most 60-year-old scientists I talk to. Number two is you guys play video games. You're all about patterns. You would love bioinformatics, I'm telling you. So where does all this information come from? And there's a lot of information. That's why I basically put up this big waterfall here. It's just, it's like trying to drink out of a big fire hydrant. Yeah. I don't know. That was something you could Google, though, for sure. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you uh, where all this information comes from. What, do, what am I actually looking at? What am I analyzing? But first, I'm going to give you a very brief history of genetics. Everybody's like, history? This isn't history. <laughs> well, it started, has anybody heard of who, you guys have done, uh, you guys have researched uh, pea plants, right? Did, who was that? What is it? Gregory Mendel. Gregory Mendel. Yes. I love this monk. Believe it or not, the church used to do a lot of science research. They were really good at it. So Gregory Mendel, in 19, 1865, figured out that in order to pass traits on, and there had to be some genetic unit to that. And he did that with peas, right? He'd breed two different color peas and then get a different color pea and figure out, you know, how are they transferring the the genes for color into the progeny. It took a while, and actually Mendel, they, a little more research, you know, in what he did, he actually probably fudged some of his numbers to make it look better, but he was actually pretty, pretty right on. So it took about 35 years before they rediscovered his work. So now everybody knew, okay, there's something that parents can pass down onto their children but they didn't know what it was. And it took until 1953 until they knew the structure. Do you know who discovered the structure of DNA? Watson and Crick, yes. Watson and Crick, 1953. I've actually met uh, Watson. He's, he's an interesting guy. But So yeah, 1953, they finally knew the structure. So they actually knew what they were looking at. Here's DNA. This is the thing that actually passes on the information. And in 1966, they figured out the code, how DNA makes it set, turns into proteins. Okay. So 1966, 1983, we found the first gene associated with a disease. This was Huntington's disease. Once this happened, all the scientists got very excited because now they thought, okay, well, we found one gene for one disease. We can find all the other ones. <laughs> Not quite, but we're getting there. And then we, you know, then they talked about, hey, we should sequence. And then this, the something happened technology that kind of allowed us to happen. It's called PCR. Does anybody know what PCR is? Probably not. It's called poly polymerase chain reaction. 
And it's basically a way for scientists to take DNA and basically make lots and lots of copies of it. So now that we had lots and lots of copies, now we could actually sequence it and figure out what's in it. And this started in 1990. The first gene for breast cancer was mapped. BRCA1, has anybody heard of that one? Has anybody heard of Angelina Jolie? Yes. What happened to her medically? Does anybody know? No. So she has this gene, this BRCA1 gene. There was a very, very a high probability that she would get breast cancer later in life. Okay. Right. So she had her breasts removed. She had a mastectomy to have her breasts removed so that she would not get cancer later on, even though she did not have cancer. We can test for these genes, and people do it all the time, that if you have the BRCA gene, it's maybe it's better to do the mastectomy, you know, get your breasts removed before you get the cancer. Um, and then, you know, we, we sequence lots of different organisms. There's yeast, E. coli. This was actually at University of Wisconsin. I rotated through this lab. <laughs> this was before, like, the computers, like, this computer here was probably worth about, like, 10 of theirs. The whole basement was just computers and wires, and every, no one combed their hair, and it was dark. And, and all these guys, they wore this shirt that said, I sequenced E. coli, these black shirts. And they run around, they were like this nerd gang around campus. It was pretty cool. And then in 2002, we sequenced mice. Why the heck would we want to sequence mice? What do you think? Because we love mice? Yeah. Sometimes we use mice for testing. Yes. We use mice. Mice is one of our biggest organisms we use to test things. So we wanted to sequence, we sequenced mice first. And then in 2003, we finished the human genome sequence. So the first human. So to sequence a human took 13 years and cost $3 billion. What do you think we can do it for now? Yeah. Ten bucks. Ten bucks. Oh, I wish. <laughs> Not quite. To sequence a human nowadays would probably take about two days and cost $2,000. What do you think this means for you guys? Well, not that expensive. Here's what this means is that at some point, everybody in this room will probably have their DNA sequenced. You will know your DNA and you will be able to access stuff that I do and check out, you know, whether you get a flush reaction when you drink, when you're 21. <laughs> So I talked a lot about the sequence, but there's a lot more than just sequence itself, right? There's also, so you have your DNA, which has, again, we said about 6 billion nucleotides. There's about 25,000 different genes in your DNA. These are the genes. That's about 1% of your, your genome, okay? The, so for your DNA to do anything in your cell, it has to make a copy of itself. So it makes a copy of these genes called messenger RNA. Has everybody heard of messenger RNA? Great. And I, I hear you're going to learn much more about that. So this messenger RNA, it's kind of like, e, like your cell sending an email to the ribosomes. Everybody heard of ribosomes? Yeah. So it's like instructions to make proteins. And then we have about 500,000 different proteins. That's a lot of stuff. And there's actually even more. They have these things called microRNAs. I don't think you went over that, did you? No. Not very much, yeah. These are these short little bits of, of RNA that will bind to the messenger RNA and it causes destruction. So there's about 900 different types of that. And in disease, we find that these are really messed up. So this is kind of a hot area right now. Even the mRNA itself isn't just 25,000, right? That with messenger RNA, you have introns and exons. You guys heard of that? Not yet. Oh, you will. <laughs> but you can shuffle them around. And so that I'm working on a gene right now that has 11 different versions of its messenger RNA. And they all do something a little different, which is crazy. All right, let's go back to proteins. Proteins are a mess. There's just so many different things you can do to them. You can add, it's like having a car. You can add headers, dual exhaust. You can, you know, put turbo on the car. You can basically add all these chemical modifications to proteins and make them do something different. Again, we can measure all of this stuff. Let's go back to the DNA again. That 
in order for DNA to fit into your cells, it has to be compacted very, very tightly. If I took the DNA out of one of my cells, it, was, it would be taller than me. That's one cell, right? Imagine taking all that and packing it into something microscopic. So we have these histones and all the DNA wraps around these little like beads in your DNA. And these can be methylated. And again, we can measure all that. And why is this important? Can everybody see this? I know that's really hard. There's two bugs down here. One is a grasshopper. It's green. It kind of hangs out, you know, by itself. Pretty mellow, pretty local. It doesn't go very much. This other organism over here is a locust. It's shorter than a normal grasshopper. It's orange, different color. It's more aggressive. And it'll swarm. It'll get with a bunch of its buddies, travel thousands of miles, and go to communities and eat all their crops and basically devastate communities. These two insects are exactly genetically identical. The only difference is the way their DNA is packed. So it's almost like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. One of them can turn into the other without even changing their DNA. So most of what I do is I look at micro or messenger RNA. So again, remember, you've got, your, you've got your DNA and your nucleus. It makes a copy of itself, sending an email to like the, the factories to make proteins. Well, we can actually hack <laughs> their email. So what we do is we collect this mRNA. We make copies of it with PCR. Then we put some fluorescent stuff on it. And we bind it to these things called gene chips. And I'm going to pass some of these out. This, let's pass it down. And just move it back that way. These things here have changed biology. That on each one of these chips is a little piece of your, of your human gene or your messenger RNA that will bind to that particular spot. Then what we can do is we can take a laser and scan this chip, and this is what it looks like. This is the data that comes off of that. Anything that's white would mean that gene's firing. There's a lot, a lot of messenger RNA, so that gene's more active. Anything kind of dark would mean that gene is not as active. Right? So once we have that, then we can assign numbers, right? If it's more bright, I'll give it a higher number. If it's dimmer, I'll give it a lower number. And again, every gene in your body we can measure. And once we do that, then we can basically characterize them based on these numbers. These are different types of tumors based on the types of genes that are active or not active in these tumors. Some of these are more aggressive than others. And this gives us a way to determine how would I potentially treat that tumor given the fact that these genes are on. Once we have numbers, then we can actually make lots of graphs. This is a PCA plot, and I'm not going to go into, you know, <laughs> the mathematics of it. It's matrix theory. You don't want to know. But anyway, given here is what we can do is we can take all the gene expression and we could say, we can take a sample and based on what their genes are doing, we could put it in three-dimensional space. So things that are closer together are more like each other. So given here, the different colors represent different cells in your body. You can see these blue ones here are skin cells. They're a lot different than your endothelial, your fire, you know, cartilage, muscle. Imagine that this would be a disease. These might be somebody with a particular disease compared to somebody who is normal. Okay, five more minutes. So that's what we do, right? I could take a bunch of samples and that people that don't have a disease and a bunch of samples from people, mRNA from people that do have a disease, and I say, what genes are different here? And again, we use mathematics, you know, mathematical tests to determine what are the genes that are different, and then we'll get a list like this. It's from this list that that's kind of what I do my stuff, is that I look at these genes and I say, what do they all have together? You know, what do they have in common? What are they different? Is there a pathway that some of these are in that we could block to maybe help uh, cure the disease? 
it's kind of like a crime mystery, really. You know, it's, I love my job. And the great thing is I work on computers, so I don't have to, I get to work from home. I'm actually dressed up today. Normally I'm wearing a, a t-shirt and shorts. <laughs> She'll vouch for me. But it's, it's really cool. And I can work on just about any disease I want because everything has DNA in it. So the world is my oyster. So some of the things that I've worked on before, has anybody heard of COPD? Yeah, it's a smoking disease. Horrible. Gosh, I hate working on it. I'm glad I, I don't really work on this disease anymore. But this would be a lung of a smoker. Very hard disease. It, there's a lot of different causes. So it's, it's a very complicated disease. There's also a disease called tuberculosis. Has everybody heard of that? Yeah, that's a horrible disease. I'm actually working on trying to characterize the parasite that causes that disease. What happens is these parasites make these microRNAs that I just talked about. And what we're trying to do is learn how to modulate those to maybe treat the disease. Pituitary tumors are very interesting. So I, w I work on pituitary tumors. There's a type of pituitary tumor. There's a lot of different cells in your pituitary, but one of them makes growth factor. And if you get a tumor, what happens is those cells just produce more and more growth factor. So the tallest person on this planet almost always has a pituitary tumor. And, but that's not a good thing. They just keep growing and growing and eventually they die. But there's also cells in your body that make luteinizing hormone or basically hormones for bre uh, uh, breastfeeding. So that if a man gets a tumor in that cell, he'll start growing breasts. Yeah, <laughs> there's some weird stuff out there, guys. And one of the ones that really kills me, it, eczema herpeticum. So this is basically, you know, we all have, uh, you know, you'll get dry skin. But with these individuals, once they get the dry skin, it allows these viruses to come invade and they get these terrible rashes in it and it affects babies. So what we're trying to do is figure out how can we stop that? How can we keep the viruses from invading? And like I said before, if it's, at some point it all becomes numbers and all these things that I, I look at, you know, I can do a lot of different other stuff. So this right now is actually, I'm, I'm analyzing survey data from the, has everybody heard of the Pace Center, right, here in town? Yeah, yeah. so I got their data and so I'm kind of looking to see what pe bands people like, you know, and which bands like the girls like and the boys and, and age groups. So it's, it's a very interesting profession for me is because not only do I get to analyze biological stuff, but, you know, I can analyze just about anything with numbers. But deep down, you know, the big question I always had is who gets to read and interpret your data, right? I just told you, you all are going to get your DNA sequenced. Are you going to trust somebody else to tell you who you are, where you came from, what you might be? Probably. I didn't. <laughs> That's why I like doing what I do is that I, you know, your DNA is who you are, right? And I think everybody should be, have the ability to be able to read it for themselves. And that's why I give talks to, to high school students or middle school students and, and hopefully try to get some of you interested in this. Because this, this field is very, it's, it's exploding. So the farther you enter the truth, the deeper it is. And the great thing about my job is when I investigate a, a, a disease, some of the things I learn are some of the first things about that disease anybody on this planet's ever known, right? It's almost like being an explorer, that we've discovered all the different, you know, we've gone to the deepest oceans and, you know, gone to the moon. But, you know, the new frontier is new knowledge. And, you know, I think this is, this is definitely a profession where you can be on that cutting edge. Um, as I said, I have a YouTube channel. If you search Michael Edwards Bioinformatics, you will find it. I am recording this lecture. You know, I might actually record the next one. <laughs> Usually probably be better. But please, you know, go to my YouTube channel. I also have a Facebook page. Um, I also have a Google Plus site where I have basically did data analytics for high schools, and you can actually do the lessons yourself if you'd like to, if this is something you're interested in. Uh, and I'm also on Spotify. Um, I do warn you that some of the lyrics are adult, but all the beats are legit. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, I get, do we have time for a few questions? Okay. Um, I'll take questions. Yeah. How long?
long do you have to go to school to get your PhD? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a hard one. I went to school. I kind of went. I did a master's degree, and I also did um, a, a PhD. So it took me 13 years in school. Normally, to get a PhD, it's five years. It's a, yeah, it's a long haul. But they, they do offer masters uh, in bioinformatics. Yeah. Say it again. The nucleotides? Yeah, yeah. ATCG? Yeah. Do you just plug that into a computer and then the computer just finds the patterns? Or do you shuffle through it? A little bit of both. So what happens is the computer says, hey, I found this anomaly and I'll bring it up. And then you kind of have to make your own personal decision going, uh, is that real or is it? So it is a lot of its machine, right? I can't go through 6 billion bits of data myself. But what happens is it'll bring things that are interesting. And then you have to make the decision. Is this something we want to pursue or not? Yes. What's up? No. If they spit on you and you take that spit and then put it in a tube, yes, you can. Totally. Yeah. So if you have that spit, does that mean you have all three billion parts of their uh, uh, sequence there? Yes, you do. That's going to be a huge issue, right? Who gets to read your DNA? And that's why I had that last slide is... If somebody finds you, cracks your DNA, imagine somebody, you know, y'all have your email accounts, right? What if somebody hacked your email? You'd be pretty mad, right? Yeah, it'd probably be pretty embarrassing for some things. Imagine if somebody hacked your DNA and goes, hey, that guy's a bedwetter, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, like, the DNA in your hair, like, is it the exact same, like, a, as the skin cell, but it's just different parts of the DNA are activated? Yes. All your DNA, the DNA in all your body is exactly the same. Again, remember the, the, the grasshoppers, right? What happens is you're, in some cells, you just shut the genes down that say produce like melatonin or, or like hair color, right? In your muscle cell, you wouldn't want that gene on. So what happens is even though you have the same DNA, you have different genes that are firing on and off in your different cells. So anybody ask a question, I'm going to give you a gene check. Yes. Say it again. I would say that herpeticum, that the one with the, the, the rashes, that's a really hard one. Um, it's really nasty. Um, where's another one? Oh, there was another one that was really bad. COPD is bad. Actually, I, I work on this, this disease called um, I, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis fibrosis. So what happens is your lungs start turning into cartilage. And so they get really hard and you can't breathe and you basically suffocate. It's a horrible disease. So yeah. Yeah. So during your job, you can determine like if someone's going to get sick in like a few days or not? Or? No. <laughs> well, actually you could potentially. That here's what they're trying to do is with a blood sample, what they want to do is be able to test whether somebody might get sick. So yes, they are working on that, and that is coming for sure. Uh, one more? We have to wrap up and let them get to lunch. Right? Okay, no problem. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.